اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم مائی ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹس دس از ڈاکٹر محمد شفیق آف ڈپارٹمنٹ آف اسلامک اینڈ پاکستان اسٹڈیز اینڈ آئی ایم اے لیکچر ان فلاسفی دا کورس آئی ایم ٹیچنگ یو از کالڈ انٹروڈکشن ٹو فلاسفی اینڈ دا کورس کوڈ از پی ایچ آئی ون زیرو ون This is lecture number 16 and today we are going to discuss what is idealism in metaphysics. Basically, this topic consists of two parts. The first part of the first lecture, we will try to look into what does idealism mean in metaphysics and also how it has been elaborated by different philosophers over the time while uh, in the second part of uh, this lecture in idealism would consist upon different types of idealism so we will start with the definition and explanation of what does idealism mean The lecture, uh, the outline of this lecture is as follows. First, we are going to introduce what is idealism and then we'll try to look into the history of idealism and look into the different schools of thought pioneered by the different uh, philosophers. Uh, first, we are going to look into platonic idealism, which was presented by uh, a very famous Greek philosopher, Plato. Then after that, we are going to discuss uh, Rene Descartes' idealism, who is considered to be the father of modernity. After that, we are going to touch into Leibniz's idealism, and he is considered to be one of the major German idealists. We'll move on to British idealism and we'll look into the George Berkeley's uh, version of idealism. And after that, we are going to discuss and look into what is the version of idealism for Hegel, a very well-known German philosopher. And after that, at the end, we are going to discuss what does Arthur Schopenhauer uh, Schopenhauer's take is on idealism in metaphysics. So, the next part of uh, this lecture, which is going to be the lecture number 17, uh, I'm just going to briefly discuss it here because uh, both are the integral part of uh, the same lecture, but uh, due to the length of the lecture and topics, I have divided into two uh, different lectures. So the second video of the series uh, about idealism, we are going to uh, look uh, briefly what is idealism and then in detail, what are the different types of idealism, such as uh, what is subjective idealism, what is transcendental idealism, and what is absolute idealism, idealism and also what is objective idealism. So, first of all, we are going to start with the definition of idealism and we are going to try to discuss what does idealism mean. Generally speaking, in the popular mind, the term idealist has a meaning which is quite different from the philosophical use of the term. Popularly, the word may mean, number one, one who accepts and lives by lofty moral, aesthetic, and religious standards. Such a man is said to be man of ideals or an idealist. Secondly, in popular sense, one who is able to see and to advocate some plan or program which does not yet exist, 
such a person is also called an idealist. Every social reformer and prophet in an idealist is an idealist in the sense because he is supporting that which has not yet come into existence. Those who work for permanent peace for the elimination of poverty may be called idealist in general sense. The term may be used in a complementary sense, meaning that which is excellent of its kind. It may be used as a term of reproach. For example, a person may, call, may be called a fanatical idealist if he stands for what other person believes to be unattainable goals or if he seems to ignore the facts and practical condition of any situation. The philosophical meaning of the term idealism is determined more by the meaning of terms idea and mind than by the term ideal. Professor Hawking, an idealist, says that for the sense, the term idealism would be more to the point. The letter has been inserted for euphonious reasons. Idealism asserts that reality is akin to ideas, thought, mind, or selves rather than the material forces. Now let's try to look into what does idealism mean in terms of metaphysics and epistemological doctrine. So idealism is the metaphysical and epistemological doctrine that ideas or thoughts make up fundamental reality. Essentially, it is any philosophy which argues that the only actual only thing actually knowable is consciousness or the contents of consciousness whereas we never can be sure that matter of anything in the outside world really exists so basically it means that the outside world does not exist, it is just a construct of our mind, which is basically ideas. Thus, the only thing, only real things are mental entities, not physical things, which exist only in the sense that they are perceived. So, to basically, to sum up uh, the definition of idealism, we may say that reality is ideal in nature. This is in contrast to materialism, which says that reality is material in nature and nothing exists without matter. While idealists would say that reality is ideal in nature. So basically, ideal is real. It's not the material world. It's not the matter, which is the reality. For idealists, the reality is something abstract, is something ideal. It's based upon idea because for them, material world and material objects they are not permanent they perish so the real thing is something which is there forever which cannot perish and the ideas are as such which cannot perish although we see that material things or material objects or even material world that is perishable. So the idealist would say that reality is 
ideal in nature and all that exists is idea and nothing else basically this material world or matter this is the product of ideas and some of the people would contend that the idea of this universe came into being first and after that this idea was materialized in terms of material universe so the idea come first that means that idea is prior and matter or material world is the product of this ideal nature of reality now let's move on to the next slide and we'll try to start with the idealism of plato plato is one of the very famous greek philosopher and has been quoted a lot in different subjects and different branches of knowledge basically plato was the pupil of socrates and socrates was such a philosopher who did not write anything any book he would stand into a marketplace gather people and start lecturing them so plato happens to be one of his uh, very uh, obedient pupils i would say because it was plato who brought the ideas of socrates into writing so whatever plato says is basically based upon the philosophy of socrates which he learned from his master socrates so there's a very famous book of uh, plato which is called ideal republic and in that book he basically comes up with the theory for an ideal state that how an ideal state can be constructed and how it can be run by different classes of people and his ideal republic basically provided the foundation for communism which was developed later on by karl marx so let's see what does plato says about idealism plato is one of the pioneers termed as idealist although his idealism is confusingly usually referred to as platonic realism because although his doctrine describes forms or universals plato maintained that these forms had their own independent existence which is not an idealist stance but a realist one so before going into detail of the realism uh, we need to concentrate upon idealism so for plato that this universe or this world is ideal in nature and its forms or universals came into being first and then it was materialized or it was converted into material things for example he would say that the idea of a chair came first and after that idea people working upon it they try to come up with material object called a chair and because he says this idea 
or these universal forms have their own independent existence that is why he is confused as a realist although he was an idealist because he believed the reality is in is ideal in nature but when he said that these forms and universes universals or maybe ideas they have their own existence their independent existence and this stance is basically called realism because a realist or a realism says that reality exists independent of mind although it might be in term in, in, in shape of idea but still it does not need a mind for its existence however it has been argued that plato believed that full reality as distinct from mere existence is achieved only through thought and so he could be described as a non subjective transcendental idealist somewhat like kant now what is non subjective or transcendental idealist this is we are going to discuss into the types of idealism in our second part of this lecture on idealism for the time being we just need to concentrate upon idealism and the plato is considered one of the fathers of idealist because he came up with this idea that reality of this universe is ideal in nature and it's not material then comes a second and very popular modern idealist whose name was rene descartes and he was a uh, french one of his very famous quotation says in french cogito ergo sum that means i think therefore i am now as you know metaphysics basically is an inquiry to know the reality the reality of this universe the reality of existence the number of reality the reality of god soul and all those things which come into this universe so while digging out the nature of reality of the uh, reality of reality i would say uh, different philosophers come up with different theories descartes being uh, one of the very kind of um, he was one of very kind of bright minds of his time i would say he also followed the principle of idealism while explaining the reality of this universe and descartes idealism says that all we really know is what is in our own consciousness and that the whole external world is merely an idea or picture in our mind now let me explain this uh, as i quoted him earlier he said cogito ergo sum that means i think therefore i am while trying to dig out the reality he comes up with a very unique methodology and he says that let's suppose we try to know the reality from zero we try to eliminate everything from our mind and from external world and let's start from the zero and he says 
I think, therefore I am. Because all this process of eliminating everything and then starting from the zero would require mind or thinking. So as far as I think, that means I do exist. His another quote says that debito or gosum, which says I doubt, therefore I am. Now thinking and doubting both needs mind. So if you have a mind, if you have a reality as mental in nature, then obviously you are able to think or doubt. So thinking or doubting basically reflects that mind exists. So if I can think, that means I do exist. This method, when applied to the rest of the universe and reality apart from self, we could say that again, if there was no mind, there was no thinking, there was no ideas, hence there would be no world. Therefore, he claimed it is possible to doubt the reality of external world as consisting of real objects. And I think, therefore I am, is the only assertion that cannot be doubted. So, he proves he tries to prove the reality of this universe in terms of ideas because he says that the only assertion that cannot be denied or doubted is the thinking. So if there is thinking, obviously that means I do exist. That is why I am thinking. And the rest of the world for him is mere illusion. They are not real objects. Basically, they are the picture of our mind. So, they are the picture of an idea. So, they are ideal in nature. For him, the reality basically is ideal in nature. Thus, Descartes can be considered as an early epistemological idealist. Now, what does epistemological idealism mean? Uh, we are going to discuss it in detail when we start uh, discussing different schools of thought in epistemology, the next branch of philosophy after metaphysics. But for the time being, let me explain it briefly that epistemological idealist is basically a rationalist. And a rationalist is the one who holds that knowledge the prior source of knowledge is mind or idea and it's not our senses. So if this world is ideal in nature, obviously we can know this world only through our mind. We cannot know ideal things by our senses. Hence he is called an epistemological idealist. Next comes a very famous German idealist, and his name was Leibniz. Leibniz was basically a contemporary of uh, Sir Isaac Newton, and both came with different kind of theories while explaining the reality of the universe. While Newton came with the theory and uh, discussed atoms to be the unit of this world. On the other hand, Leibniz came up with another idea and he called the units of this universe as monads. For Newton, the atoms or the unit of this universe is material in nature, while for Leibniz, the units 
of this universe or world are ideal in nature and he calls them monads hence his uh, philosophy is called monodology so leibniz expressed a form of idealism known as panpsychism the true atoms of universe are monads individual non interacting substantial forms of being having perception in order to understand what these monads are i would say if you know or if you understand what the atoms are for newton same are the monads for leibniz but the only difference between the two is that atoms are material in nature while monads are ideal in nature they are individual non interacting substantial forms of being and they have perception for leibniz the external world is ideal in that it is a spiritual phenomenon whose motion is the result of a dynamic force dependent on these simple and material monads god the central monad created a pre-established harmony between the internal world in the minds of the alert monads and the external world of real objects so that the resulting world is essentially an idea of monard's perception now let me explain it for leibniz as being a idealist obviously he believes that everything which is real is ideal in nature so for him god who calls him the central monad he is also ideal in nature and he created a harmony which was pre-established between the internal world in the minds of alert monads and the external world of real objects now this external world which for us apparently exist it has a harmony or connection with the mind with an the central monad an absolute mind which is god he has created other alert monads which are the minds of his creature and then he has created a kind of harmony between material objects and these monads and this alert monads or these minds so that the resulting world is essentially an idea of the monad's perception now what does it mean it means the way a monad perceives the way the mind perceives or the way the mind sees the external world that is how this external world exists so this external world of material objects is solely dependent upon minds and their perception so if there are no minds there are no ideas there is no external or objective world hence the ultimate reality or the primary reality of this universe is ideal or is a mind and it's not material or it's not a matter matter or material is mere perception of monads this is what leibniz's idealism is now we move on to another school of thought uh, sorry another philosopher who is considered to be one of the pioneers of british empiricism george berkeley 
he's also called Bishop Barclay because he was a bishop. And being a British, he's considered to be a pioneer of British empiricism or father of idealism. So, George Berkeley, known as the father of idealism, and he formulated one of the purest forms of idealism in early 18th century. His argument is that he says that our knowledge must be based on our perceptions and that there was indeed no real knowable object behind one's perception. In effect, that what was real was perception itself. Okay, let me try to explain this part. For Bishop Berkeley, all our knowledge is dependent or based are founded upon our perceptions and without these perceptions obviously there would be no knowledge now what is this perception this is basically not something produced by material things perception is basically the creation of our mind Hence, if there is no perception, it means there are no material objects because we won't be able to know them. And if we won't be able to know them, they won't exist. So the real material objects depend upon our perception. He explained how it is that each of us apparently has much the same sort of perceptions of an object by bringing in God as the immediate cause of all of our perceptions. Again, in his philosophy, being a theistic philosopher, believing in God, strong believer in God, being a bishop, George Berkeley says that God is the immediate cause of all of our perceptions. That is why each of us individually have the same perception of an object because they are all connected by God who is the immediate cause of all perceptions. So his version of idealism is usually referred as subjective idealism or dogmatic idealism. Now, what is subjective or dogmatic idealism? Again, next part of this lecture we are going to discuss in detail, but here I would give you a brief idea about subjective idealism. There are two major uh, kinds, objective and subjective idealism. Subjective means individual or basically inside. Now, my subjective idea could be different than yours and yours could be different than the third person and so on and so forth. So there are different, as many subjects, there must be as many ideas or as many perceptions of different objects but because God's position in Barclay's idealism is central and he is the immediate cause of all our perceptions he is the one who connects all of our perceptions mine yours theirs everyone's that is why we have apparently same sort of perception but at the same time, it's subjective because it is inside our minds. Similarly, uh, as Iqbal would say in his verse that 
अपने मन में डूब कर पाजा सुराग जिंदगी तू अगर मेरा नहीं बनता न बन अपना तो बन नाउ द रियलिटी इज सब्जेक्टिव इन नेचर एंड दैट इज व्हाट बाकले सेज दैट इट इज सब्जेक्टिव एंड इकबाल सेज ही सेकंड्स हिम ही सेज दैट इन ऑर्डर टू नो द रियलिटी वी हैव टू गो इनसाइड आवरसेल्फ अपने मन में डूबना है इन ऑर्डर टू नो द रियलिटी and if we want to get into ourselves obviously that is not something material that is ideal hence barclay is one of the pioneers or he is called to be father of idealism but i would say he is the father of modern idealism now let's move to the another gigantic or very famous philosopher hegel and let's see what does he say about idealism hegel is the famous journal the famous journal german idealist who says that any doctrine such as materialism for example that asserts that finite qualities or merely natural objects are fully real is mistaken why because finite qualities depend on other finite qualities to determine them now let me explain few terms here used which might be new for you now what is the finite quality obviously uh, all the reality on all the material world we know has some sort of qualities now if an object has certain qualities which are dependent upon another object these qualities are called finite qualities for example the quality of a chair if we say that would be wood if it is a wooden chair obviously now the quality of woodness which is finite in nature obviously of of a chair that depends upon the quality of another object and that is wood and wood wood's quality depend upon the tree and the tree quality would depend upon the soil the water the air so on and so forth so all these qualities they or finite in nature for hegel because they are dependent upon each other for their existence so if something is dependent upon something else that cannot be real so hegel called his philosophy absolute idealism in contrast to the subjective idealism of berkeley for berkeley as i said that idealism exists inside of us that is subjective in nature on the other hand for hegel the idealism is not subjective in nature it is absolute or it is objective idealism he based his doctrine more on plato's belief that self determination through the exercise of reason achieves a higher kind of reality than physical object now what does it mean he bases his doctrine just like plato that self determination through the exercise of reason achieves a higher kind of reality than physical objects when we use our reason 
reason means our brains, our ideas, our mind, only then we are able to achieve a higher kind of reality, a glimpse of that reality which is absolute in nature, which is not dependent upon our subjective minds, which exist independently and that can be known only through our reason, our mind. So, although he is an idealist, just like Barclay while saying that the reality is ideal in nature and not material in nature, but he differs with Berkeley saying that for Berkeley, idealism is subjective. We have to go inside in order to know the reality. While for Hegel, no, reality exists outside somewhere and that is an absolute mind for Hegel. That absolute mind can be known only through the exercise of reason, only through the use of our minds, only through ideas which not only says that for knowledge mind is essential or mind, mind, uh, mind is foundational in order to know but also contends that reality is ideal in nature. That is why we can know the reality only through our minds, only through our reason and not by our perception or our senses. So he is basically called an absolute idealist. Another very famous German philosopher called Arthur Schopenhauer Although he is famous for uh, various reasons, he is also happens to be an idealist. Schopenhauer basically accepts Kant's division of the universe into phenomenal and noumenal, suggesting that noumenal reality was singular, whereas phenomenal experience involves multiplicity, and effectively argued that everything however unlikely is ultimately an act of a will. This must be a bit hard to digest for you guys because uh, first we need to explain a little bit about Kant's division of uh, phenomena and noumena. Immanuel Kant was one of the uh, very very famous and great philosopher uh, I personally like him very much because uh, his philosophy appeals me so much. Uh, he comes up with the explanation of, of, of this universe saying that uh, every object in this universe has two aspects. One is one he calls phenomena and the other one he's called, he calls noumena. Phenomena is that aspect of any object which is knowable to us, which we can know. While noumena or internal reality of an object, what is that? That is basically not possible for us to know. Hence, he has described the limitations of our knowledge. But I won't go into detail of that uh, his theory because uh, that is going to be discussed in epistemology, uh, Kantian theory. But for the time being, we just need to understand what does phenomena and noumena mean. So phenomena are those qualities of an object which can be known by us, while noumena are internal reality of an object that cannot be known by us. And that's what he called uh, noumena. Now, Schopenhauer accepts Kant's idealism uh, combined with his non-rational ontological realism. However, on display throughout the world as will and representation. This is the name of the Schopenhauer's book. 
he expects he accepts uh, without reservation kant's argument that space and time and causality are forms of our own representation that we know a priori or we know it prior these space time and uh, causality they are basically the construct of our mind we know then we, don't, we know these ideas prior to know any object in space and time and the causality so schopenhauer accepts that but he does perceive that acceptance the world is my representation where the sheer mindness or representation is supposed to be a form more universal than any other form what does it mean no truth is more certain no truth is more independent of all others and no truth is less in need of proof than this one that everything there is for cognition the whole world is only an object in relation to a subject an intuition of a beholder now that basically means schopenhauer thinks that in order to know the objects or this world there must be a relation between that object and our minds so if we don't have mind we cannot know these objects so if we can if these objects or this material world depends upon our minds or depends upon our ideas that simply means that they are not real the reality never ever depends upon anything it has its own qualities so the reality for schopenhauer is again ideal in nature and it's not dependent upon this material world or any material objects hence he is called uh, an idealist although he differs uh, from other idealists in his stance but uh, for the time being i would say that we just need to understand that schopenhauer is also an idealist proving his idealism just by his principle of relationship for him the reality is singular whereas phenomenal experience involves multiplicity and effectively he argues that everything however unlikely is ultimately an act of will if we don't have will we don't know the reality will for him is alone gives man the key to his own appearance reveals to him the meaning and shows him the inner workings of his essence his deeds his movements and will if you think closely will is not material in nature will is something ideal in nature so everything depends upon will basically means everything depends upon ideas so if something depends upon ideas that means it's it's not real and if it's not real then the thing which it depends upon must be real and that is idea hence arthur schopenhauer is also an idealist now the next part of this lecture which i am going to record separately we are going to look into different types of uh, idealism although we looked into the definition and the history of idealism throughout philosophy and because of the shortage of time we cannot touch upon all the idealists in philosophy 
philosophy. Therefore, I, I chose those who are very important. But without understanding different types of idealism, it won't be possible for us to grasp the whole idea behind this idealism. So we need to also understand what is the different, what are the different types of idealism, such as subjective idealism, transcendental idealism, absolute idealism, and objective idealism. Again, these are not only four types of idealism. There are certain other types of idealism, but these are the more important ones and the major ones. So we are just going to discuss these in detail in our next recorded lecture. Uh, till then, try to understand the definition and the history of idealism meanwhile, uh, so the, that uh, it equips you to understand different types of idealism. And uh, till then, I would say, take good care of yourself and be safe. And I will see you in the next lecture. And these are the books recommended. Uh, these are the two major books. If you get hold of one of these, that would, I suppose, be sufficient for you to understand the, the concept of idealism and what is uh, the role of idealism in metaphysics. So, uh, if even if uh, after reading this book and listening to this lecture and the online search, if you could not understand anything or if you have any issues or any questions, please do ask, uh, let me know uh, before our next lecture so that we can explain these different ideas or concepts which are not clear uh, before starting the new topic. So till then I will say uh, Allah Hafiz to you and see you next lecture. Thank you very much and goodbye.